beginning chapters that Luke uses to introduce us to Jesus' ministry. Three and a half chapters of preparation. I mean, Luke, our meticulous physician who is working on finding all of the relevant details for us that we need to know. He has a careful introduction to John the Baptist. Uh, we had seen that in chapter one where we, heard, we uh, understood about his unusual birth. Uh, by natural means, but uh, to a, a couple who had really despaired of having a child. And there was a very clear prophecy that uh, his father, John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, made with regard to who he was to be in this kingdom. About 20 years between the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3, as your little workbook had pointed out. So these, these boys that we, found, we saw as, as babies are now grown, and we think that Jesus, uh, as we we're told a little bit later, was about 30 years old when all of these events began now to take place. 400 years God hadn't spoken a word, and all of a sudden he, is, he has a megaphone, and he is, is making sure that all of these pieces are put into place. Uh, it, he continues to anchor his account to the world affairs. He's the only one of the gospel writers that does this. As you see in verse 1, he very carefully talks about uh, who's, who's the emperor, who is the governor, uh, and also, in fact, he gives us a number of other names that we're wishing we didn't have to read. Um, but also, he connects it to who is uh, in the leadership of the Jewish uh, believers as well, because he talks about Annas and Caiaphas. And you had a little note that was helpful, I think, in your workbook about uh, how we have a couple of high priests when, as we looked at the book of Hebrews, we realized there's only supposed to be one, but apparently this became a political plum uh, for uh, Jews in the Roman Empire. And so Annas and Caiaphas were the, um, were the high priest at that particular time. So he anchors us in this, in this timing, time frame, helps us, I think, to realize we're not just, this was not just an imaginary thing that he was doing, but we have something really concrete to work with. Uh, <clears throat> And so as I've looked at this, you, you could probably have made just maybe even a better outline than I, but I thought I'd put it on the board in case some people would like to see it. Uh, preparation is from verses 1 to 20 in this chapter because that's what John is doing is he's preparing the way for Jesus. Uh, the baptism of Jesus starts in 21 and goes through uh, the end of the chapter. I have uh, dumped the genealogy <laughs> into that even though it, it is not uh, totally related, but that's the way the text way works. And then finally, in chapter 4, the first 13 verses, we're going to look at the temptation. So it's preparation, baptism, and then temptation. And as we go through this, I hope you're looking for some of the themes that we talked about. What are some of the characteristics of uh, Luke's writing? I'm going to try to highlight a couple of them as I go through this talk, and I think you may have picked that up, too, as you were studying at home. Let's think about the preparation in the verses, verses 1 to 20 of chapter 3. Uh, we might think of John as a warm-up act for Jesus. You know how you go to a concert and you've got, you know, an hour's worth of kind of B-level groups that are going to be uh, <laughs> warming up the audience until the real guy comes and then he does his program and you're there for like four or five hours. Uh, this is not a warm-up in that way. This is not B-level at all. This is totally in the plan of God. And one of the commentators that I read talked about John the Baptist as one of the hinges that hist on which history has turned. Uh, he is a, a really key figure with regard to he's not Jesus. He makes that very clear, especially in the Gospel of John, but he certainly is, has an important role with regard to that. He was, a, he was the last one of the Old Testament prophets. You will see uh, the kind of the language that he uses was very similar to some of the very, very um, pointed, uh, we might even say harsh language that the Old Testament prophets used when they were pointing out God's uh, concerns and bringing about judgment because of the sins of the people. So he was what we consider the last, he kind of straddles the Old Testament and the New Testament in that regard. He also fulfilled prophecy. 
as you see in our text here. Uh, because he, we find in verse um, 2, he, the word of the Lord came to John here. This is now again, 400 years has happened. Now we have God speaking to uh, one of, of his prophets here. Uh, he was in the desert, we're told that. He went to the country all around Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sins. I'll talk about that in a moment. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low, Cro the crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. Uh, Luke, it's not his primary task to link pro fulfilled prophecy with, uh, the old, with the Old and the New Testament. Matthew does a lot more of that in, in his gospel. But um, this is important for Luke to anchor this, the, um, the function and the message of John the Baptist in the uh, identity of a messenger that was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 40 that now is actually taking form in, in, this, um, in this day and age with regard to that. Uh, we are told he lived in the desert. Uh, at the end of chapter 1, we found that out. And Matthew describes him, um, you, perhaps you know this, uh, he wore uh, clothes of camel's hair, he had a leather belt. Uh, his food was just the native, what was available there in the desert, locusts and wild honey. He was, he was, he was a, a wilderness man, apparently, and, apparently the, and he was an attractive man in that regard. <clears throat> Uh, Luke doesn't give us that, this is not his, that's not what he wants to do is give us a description uh, of, uh, the physical description of Luke, at the, uh, of John at this particular time. He is preaching, verse 3, a baptism for repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the function of that is described in verses 4 to 6 because what he is doing is what had been prophesied before, and that was to get ready a people so that God incarnate could then do the work that he came to do. <clears throat> um, you know how you get ready for your mother-in-law to come. You straighten things up, don't you? You try to get your husband to fix the stuff that needs to be fixed and all of that. Uh, when a, and a dignitary in our uh, time comes to town, there's all sorts of preparations. You, you even have roads resurfaced and, and all that kind of thing. It was amazing to me. I, I have had the opportunity to be in, in Beijing several times, and I was there in 2003, I think it was, before the Olympics. And uh, then when I went back a couple of times later and during the Olympics uh, at 2008, it was amazing how at least the, the streets that everybody went on to get to the various venues totally changed, totally changed. They had, uh, sadly, I'm sure, had torn down a number of the sh shanties and shacks that had lined the streets. They had kind of bulldozed some of the neighborhoods. That was not a nice thing, but what they had done was they had gotten the place ready for all these people to come from the worldwide uh, venues and also to then to put a good showing on uh, the city of Beijing. Well, what John's job was, was to get people ready on the inside. And what does he do? He says, the way to get ready for the Messiah to come is to repent. That's what he is speaking about in, that, in those verses. Uh, the word repent, as you may know, is a word in Greek that talks about change. It's metanoia. <clears throat> Excuse me, and it means to change. It's closely related to the Hebrew word, which is sub or shuv, which means to turn. Because the concept in repentance is, uh, you're, well, my kind of garden variety uh, uh, definition is, sorry enough to quit. I mean, you are going to turn around and you are going to go a different way. And that's the, the message that John was giving uh, to these people. He's speaking as a prophet. And in fact, um, when Jesus gave his opinion of, of John in, um, in Matthew chapter 11, which you do not need to turn to, but he says, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Now, he himself was, of course, uh, with regard to his, his deity. Uh, but among regular people, uh, who was all the rest of, of, of the uh, 
of the population of the universe, uh, all, no one has risen greater than John the Baptist. And yet, uh, John, Jesus says then, the person who's least in the kingdom is greater than he. Because John looked forward to the, to the crucifixion. We look back and have all the benefits of what we studied in our Acts chapter 2 lesson, if you were here for our Sunday school lesson, uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church, and all of that. So Jesus had a very high regard for John the Baptist. They were, they were physical cousins in that way. We don't know how linked they were because their upbringing was most likely in two very separate geographical places. But he, Jesus knew that this was the man who was to be the, the uh, forerunner prophesied. And in fact, Jesus says, th in fact, this is the Elijah that was promised. That Malachi said, God, God's going to send Elijah uh, to prepare the hearts of the people uh, for the, the coming of, of, the, of the Messiah. Um, G John is very, very graphic, very, well, he would not win a popularity contest because look at verse 7. There were crowds coming out, by the way. There were many crowds, probably a very diverse group, all levels of society coming. We know later on we hear, and especially in some of the other Gospels, that the religious leaders were uh, coming. But many, many, many of the common people were so attracted to this man who was speaking uh, very vocally, very directly uh, out in the wilderness. And most likely, as we know from what we understand about what God does with us when he gets us ready for, some, for, for something, there is, you just say, you know, I'm, I'm missing something. I really want to know more, or I want to be more, I want to do more. And most likely these people, many of them, had, had that, oh, there's something missing in my life. Well, what is it? And so they come and they hear John and they realize that here is a message that is not a very pleasant message. What does he say? You brood of vipers, snakes. Um, and of course, immediately, many of us, not liking snakes, think about Genesis 3 and the fact that the serpent was a snake that, that pulled all of this, all of, uh, this into as Adam and Eve went willingly uh, in, into sin. Uh, and so calling people snakes is not the best PC thing. <laughs> I, don't, I, will, I will just tell you that. Uh, I saw something uh, several year, years ago, I think, about the, where one of the news broadcasts was talking about a forest fire, how devastating it was. And it showed how the animals, even before the fire came, they were all exiting the forest, moving away from the from the uh, what would be eventual danger for them and this is what John is saying to these people you are snakes you are you've been warned to flee from the coming wrath why are you coming here to hear me why have you, why is there something about my message that you want um, he says produce fruit in keeping with repentance and don't begin to say well we have Abraham as our father so we don't need to repent that was one of the thoughts that was present in Judaism at that time is that the Jews were chosen people and therefore they did not need to uh, do any repenting of any sort because their place in heaven, their individual place and place as Jews was assured. In fact, this baptism, the baptism that John was performing was something that no good Jew, unless they were under the conviction of sin, no good Jew would have ever submitted to because that would indicate that they had something in them that needed to be cleansed. Baptism being, of course, uh, the, uh, the way of, physically speaking, uh, describing the cleansing that happened. And so he calls them snakes. He says, don't, don't try to just tag on to Abraham because he says, uh, God could even make stones uh, be, uh, be children of Abraham. You're, you're nothing special with regard to that. But then he says, verse 9, the axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Visual of the fact that this is happening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the axe is already there. It's ready to cut down the tree. There is a judgment coming. His message was not one of sweetness and light. His message of one was one uh, of preparing people for the coming than of the one who would be the solution to, uh, to their, uh, their sinfulness. Uh, he says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And so verse 10, 
these people are evidently quite angst about this and they say, what should we do with regard to that? That's one of the signs of conviction of sin is, what can I do? What can I do? Remember in Acts chapter 2, the people who heard Peter's sermon and he said, you were the ones who crucified him 50 days before. Uh, you are the ones, and they're saying, what should we do? What can we do? And here again is a, is a response of, of genuine repentance. What should we do? So John, he can't say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved because that hasn't happened yet. But what does he say? If you are truly repenting, you will be able to show it in your life. And so he speaks to the particular classes of people that are, that are there uh, asking the question. He talks about the man, the rich guy, the one with two tunics, should share with one who has none. Uh, the one who has food should do the same. And so the they show generosity would be one way that these people would demonstrate that they were truly repentant on the inside. Tax collectors, very hated uh, group of people with regard, they, they were collecting money for the Roman government, which was very much hated by the Jews. And so they come and they say, they want to be baptized, what should we do? And so what uh, John is telling them, don't collect any more than you're required to because there was not a, um, a computerized system as far as getting your, what is it, 10 or whatever kind of a, a blank with regard to your income tax. Uh, there was a tax that Rome required that the tax, that the people pay. But then these guys were there out there in their booths and nobody was, was policing them and so they could ask anything they wanted. And the rest of it they kept in their pocket. Zacchaeus was one of those guys. In fact, we're going to meet him in, in Luke's um, gospel because he's one who says, I'm going to give back five times as much as I have taken from people. So what, what the tax collectors are supposed to do? Uh, well, they are supposed to have integrity. They are supposed to be concerned about these people from whom they are taking the money. Don't take any more than you're required to. And then even soldiers who would have been they could have been Jews because the Jews were drafted. They could have been Romans. They were serving the Romans anyway. What should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. So here were people who probably were trying to uh, abuse, subjugate uh, the people that they were supposed to be caring for. So he says, um, have integrity, have honesty, have human concern. Uh, he, and so it's clear that John is not advocating revolution. He's not advocating political rebellion. In fact, instead he's saying, you've got to change from the inside out. That's the way that the world will be changed. And that's exactly what happened. Starting in the book of Acts, we see that the, the uh, Jerusalem, Samaria, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, that's how the gospel has spread. That's how Christianity has spread, is through inward change that's demonstrated in outward uh, values that have now changed. And so <clears throat> in verse 15, uh, the people were all waiting expectantly, were wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ, because here is this figure, uh, very, very impressive, with words that are clearly from God, and they're wondering if he might be the Christ or the Messiah. There had been many times that people had wondered this. So John answers them, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Uh, this is now something that Jesus refers to when he trains his disciples before he ascends to heaven. He says, uh, this is what's going to happen to you, the, the, the fi final fulfillment of this prophecy that John gave is going to be taking place. He says, uh, there's someone coming who, I, I, he's so great, I can't even bend over to tie his shoes. I mean, it, it's just, he is so much greater than I. What does John say in um, John chapter? What does Je John say in Jesus John chapter one? He must increase, and I must. Maybe it's three. He must increase, and I must decrease. This was his attitude. He knew who he was. He knew who Jesus uh, was going to be, uh, and that's what, why he says, "I am not the Messiah. I'm only the one." who is going to prepare the way uh, for the Messiah. He speaks in verse 17 about a winnowing fork. Uh, many of us don't know uh, old-fashioned agricultural um, ways of, of harvesting things, but um, and some of you might, and some of you may have been, I remember touring in Italy so, and being driven down roads, and you see 
farmers doing exactly the same thing that these guys were doing, and that is they, they harvest the wheat, but then they have like a shovel or, or a pitchfork, and they, they throw up uh, this, what they, what's been harvested, uh, and the, the heavier the grains of wheat will fall to the ground where they can be shoveled up. And the chaff, w what is mixed in with there, but you can't really tell what it's like and what it is until you do this process. That gets blown away. Uh, Psalm chapter 1, the ungodly is like the chaff that the wind blows away. The ungodly will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. So, he, so John says already this is beginning to happen. Already this judgment is beginning to happen. Uh, he says, his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached. What did he preach? He preached good news to them. This doesn't sound like good news, does it? Really does not sound like good news, except it is, because an integral part of the good news, the gospel, is the bad news. Because you and I, confronted with the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, um, must have understood that we needed it. That, as Paul says in Romans, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so he was preaching the good news. He didn't have the whole thing because it hadn't happened yet in, in actual time. But he did, was preaching the good news of the gospel. And in fact, if you turn back to Luke chapter 1, uh, uh, Zechariah, in, um, when he is, John, Luke chapter 1, verse 16, when Gabriel's talking to Zechariah and telling him that this child will be born, telling him what this child was going to do, verse 16 of Luke chapter 1, many of the people of Israel he will bring back to the Lord. Here's the bad news. You've got to come back to the Lord. Uh, he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's what John the Baptist was doing uh, in his ministry with regard to that. Not, definitely not a warm-up act. This is integral to what God has, insists has to happen. All done to prepare the way for the Lord. And indeed, when God convicts us of sin, there has to be this repentance, this turning, this saying, I'm sorry enough to quit. I am going to move forward in the other direction. And then we can accept the wonderful work uh, that Jesus has done for us. So John's work was very, very important, very preliminary, yes, but very important. Then in verse 21, we move into the baptism. Uh, and interestingly enough, Luke's account of the baptism is the shortest of any one of the gospel writers. He, uh, and it's, he seems to be wanting to pull through one of his themes, and that is prayer, because in um, verse 21, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. Matthew has a little bit of a conversation that went behind that. Uh, and he, as he was praying, remember one of the characteristics that Luke pulls out of Jesus' life is that he was, was often devoted to prayer. And so in, we don't know how, what it looked like, but he was praying probably after the baptism, and heaven was opened, the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Thirty years of not hearing the Father's voice, and then all of a sudden, as he submits himself to identifying himself with the people he came to save, he didn't have to be, repent. Obviously, and that was one of John's problems, was he says, I sh you should be baptizing me, not me baptizing you. But in identifying himself with his people, as he had done that, um, then uh, he, the father was pleased with that. Thirty years of being hidden in this dunky old town of Nazareth. I, this is my beloved son, um, I am with, in, with whom I am well pleased. Uh, so he, uh, his baptism had him identify with mankind. So that's why he's called the son of man. Remember we talked about that the first time. Um, Holy Spirit came. Why did God in flesh need the Holy Spirit? Well, one reason was that uh, in the Old Testament, uh, especially in Isaiah, which we're going to study after Christmas, 
Uh, but especially in Isaiah, there are a number of passages where the prediction of the Messiah it re is told in the context that the Messiah will be filled with the Spirit. Uh, you don't need to, if you want to jot this text down, you can do that. Isaiah 11, 1 to 5, I will read it for you. Uh, another Isaiah text is 42, 1, talks about being the, the Messiah having the Spirit. And then Isaiah 61, 1 is another one, three of them, for different roles that Jesus had. In Isaiah 11, the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of power the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. This we will see in our next lesson is something that Jesus uh, specifically said, I am fulfilling exactly what Isaiah 800 years before this had actually prophesied. And so one reason why he was baptized and why this then, why the Holy Spirit came, was to confirm that here indeed is a fulfillment of what was prophesied by Isaiah about the Messiah. Uh, the, as I said, the vocal uh, approval of, the, of God his Father must have been absolutely remarkable for him. And then, of course, we know now, because we've read chapter 4, that the next thing on the list for Jesus to do was to undergo a really humongous temptation. More than any of us would ever even consider uh, with, and he was interacting directly with Satan. And so we're told in chapter 4, the Spirit led him into the wilderness. Uh, and so the Holy Spirit uh, prepared him and empowered him, apparently, for this ordeal that he was going to be undergoing. <clears throat> uh, and so uh, John, we're, as, as, as we, John the Baptist now fades, uh, and Jesus himself, as we see verse 23, was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. And then in typical Hebrew form, we get a genealogy. And you'll be very pleased, I'm not going to try <laughs> to read it all and tell you who all these people were. <clears throat> there is a concern, and your uh, workbook at least alerted you to it, if, if not solved all the problems. And that is that this genealogy, the, the record of who was a father of whom was a father of whom and whatever <clears throat> traces Joseph's now this is the this is the fa fa half father uh, he was the, the designated earthly father but of course he wasn't the physical father the Holy Spirit was uh, but the traces Joseph's lineage uh, back to Adam clearly understanding, and this is one of Luke's themes again, that this is, a, this is a man of the people. This is someone who identifies not just with the Jews. Matthew's genealogy traces it through the kingly line, through uh, David, and all the way through Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. We're not sure exactly how these names got put in there, uh, because some of them describe different generational names than the, one of them, Matthew, than Luke. Um, there was a purpose. Uh, and I'm not, if you want to Google it and try to find it, I, you can if you want, but I, I'm not very clear on how we can actually reconcile it except that, as uh, I mentioned, Luke wants to, to convince us that he is truly a man of the people. So he takes us back to Adam. Uh, Abraham, uh, Matthew wants to take us back to Abraham as the real Jewishness of, uh, of, the, of the Messiah. And so uh, that uh, seems to be his agenda, at least when he says this. But the fact that Luke includes a genealogy is something that I think is very important. Most of the scholars nowadays don't think that this was Mary's genealogy. We thought that in the past. Uh, but as the scholars have looked at this, they don't hold that quite as tightly as they used to. Uh, when we get to heaven, we can ask, okay? You corner them, and I'll come and stand in the line, and we'll see what happens. Um, but So the baptism of Jesus is very significant, and Luke presents it in a way that, that tells us another thing about Jesus that he wants us to understand as he has compiled all of these facts. But then going into the temptation, starting in chapter 4, verse 1, the question in my mind is, why would the Holy Spirit lead Jesus into the desert to be tempted 
of the devil for 40 days. I mean, what part of his training or of his ministry uh, was this about? Uh, we're not told exactly. Uh, we can look at the event and how it is described, and we can deduce maybe a few things. Uh, I think the thing that comes out is um, the, every time Satan speaks to Jesus, he says, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God. So this temptation was not to attack his humanity, although that was really at risk with 40 days uh, of fasting in this very, very bleak wilderness. But apparently Satan wants to uh, dislodge Jesus' confidence in the Father. What does he say? Verses um, 3, through 3 and 4, first of all, he says, you know, you're hungry, why not? Get some bread here. Your, your physical needs uh, outweigh the spiritual value of who you are and what you are to do. And Jesus says, uh-uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus had, it was embedded in him, the, the text of Scripture enough so that he could use this. Um, man does not live by bread alone. He provided bread for 40 years for these people in the wilderness. But uh, if he hadn't, that would, that would, God would still have cared for these people in some way. Uh, and so he says, man does not live by bread alone. So satisfaction of your bodily needs, um, that's Satan is trying to dislodge Jesus' trust of the Father. What does he say next, verses 5 through 8? He talks about um, bowing down and worshiping him. He says, I'll give you all, the, all their splendor and, and authority for it has been given to me. Ah, oh, well, um, not really. Uh, he has ha give, been given by God some level of activity on this earth. And there is a um, text in the New Testament that talks about Satan being the prince of the power of the air. Uh, but Satan, remember Job? What does Satan have to do? He has to, he has to actually go to God and ask for permission to do what he was going to do to Job. And so although the devil says, I've had, this is my bailiwick, uh, Jesus says, uh, what does he say? Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Uh, what he was offering to Jesus was a shortcut. He is going to be worshiped throughout the universe. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But this was not the time. He could not circumvent the cross and still do the job that he had uh, committed to do for the Father. So again, trying to unsettle Jesus' confidence in God. And then the third one, in verses 9 through 12, uh, he takes him up to the highest point of the temple. There, might, there was kind of a legend among the Jews that all of a sudden, uh, because Malachi says, the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. And so there was kind of a legend about, about the fact that Messiah might appear at the pinnacle of the temple. Uh, we don't know if that's exactly what Satan was trying to approximate or not. Uh, but he says, uh, well, why don't you trust God? Um, you know, if indeed you are the Son of God, uh, God's going to catch you if you do this really daring thing. Uh, and what does Jesus say? Uh, and by the way, he uses scripture too, doesn't he? Uh, but Jesus says, verse 12, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus is able to, from the Pentateuch, from Deuteronomy, uh, be so filled with scripture that he can uh, bring that forth in a way that totally shuts down the mouth of Satan. Uh, I want to talk just a moment about God tempting or testing us uh, because Sometimes people are erroneously uh, convinced of the fact that God tempts people to sin. And some of the older versions used that word tempt instead of test. God never tempts us to do evil. Satan does. And in fact, James chapter 1, if you want to look that up, verses 13 to 15, talks about the fact that if you're tempted to do evil, it's not from God, because he could never do that but it's from Satan or 
what's inside of you. And that is the old man who likes to sin. So God never tempts people to do evil. People may try to tempt or test God uh, to, to ask him for some unusual sign uh, or whatever. That's what Satan was doing here. He was saying, well, you know, this will really be credible if you prove God in this regard. So God, people may tempt to test God, but uh, they don't, that's not the way to go with regard to that. God does test people. He tested Abraham when he said, sacrifice your only son. And when, that, when, he is, when God has provided that, that ram from the thicket, God says to Abraham, now I know that you trust me fully. Did God need to know that? No. But Abraham needed to know that, didn't he? And so God uses these testings. He tested Israel in the wilderness for 40 years, and they flunked. They didn't make it at all because they didn't trust God. Uh, but, and that's clearly stated in Deuteronomy as well. So God tempt, does not tempt to do evil. He tests us to see what's inside of us. Um, you may be thinking of, of comparisons to Adam and Eve in the garden and the three, uh, the three things that, that Eve thought it was good, good to eat and good for the eyes and pleasant or whatever it was. First John 2 talks about how we're supposed to not love the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does. Uh, these three categories, First John 2, 1, 16, those three categories, can be identified as the kind of temptation that Satan was putting in front of Jesus at this time. We don't have time to do that. You can do that for your homework. Uh, but then what do, we, what do we see at verse 13? He says, when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. The devil always was niggling, uh, but we don't see another great temptation uh, until we see in, at least in the Gospel of Luke, we don't see uh, him uh, rearing his head again until he enters Judas, when Judas goes to betray Jesus. Uh, <clears throat> so you and I must ask ourselves, just as um, we see Jesus refuting this temptation with solid scripture, uh, do you, do I have a working knowledge of the scripture well enough to know how to address Satan when he comes and tries to tempt me to, as our song says, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upwards I look and see him there, the one who, uh, one who paid for all my sin. Uh, you and I must have a working knowledge of the Word of God if we are to be able to uh, in, endure and triumph in temptation as Jesus did. Now, none of us are ever going to be tempted to the degree that Jesus was, thankfully, because we would capitulate immediately. But uh, Peter's, 1 Peter, uh, in chapter 5, uh, verses 6 through 11, he says, um, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. That's where the understanding of Scripture, what is true, how can I say this back to Satan? Uh, resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. And then he talks about the fact that God, the God of all grace, will bring you to himself. Uh, is Satan going to come and, and sit on my shoulder? No. Uh, but I will be tempted to, to not, not believe God, to not trust him. I will, the kinds of temptations that he gave to Eve, and she succumbed, he also gave to Jesus, and he did not. If you are the son of God, do this. And Jesus said, it is written. And so uh, as these beginning chapters introduce us to the life and ministry of Jesus, we're now ready to finally uh, begin to see how he interacts with the people and brings forth his message. Thank the Lord for John the Baptist, don't you think, uh, with regard to bringing this good news of repentance. Lord, thank you for this uh, wonderful scripture that you've given us. Thank you for the delight of studying together. Thank you for the truths of your word and for the way that you make it available to us. Uh, thank you for uh, things in our memory that we have already placed there that uh, are truths of your word, uh, and the way that we have this text to also embolden us and empower us uh, to resist uh, the temptations that come to us 
from our sinful man as well as from outside. Uh, thank you that you have provided a way for us to be righteous before you. Uh, thank you that we are going to be seeing this as we see the ministry of Jesus. Go with us now, and uh, as we enjoy the thoughts that you have put in our minds from this morning, in Jesus' name, amen.